we are going to define a new quantity impulse which is going to be the time integral of a force over time. Now note that we're going to define this in one direction and you could still define impulse uh, to be a vector, right? It is a vector, but in this case we're going to say that we need to consider one force at a time. Note that impulse is capital J that's a little confusing, right? Why is impulse J? I don't know if there's actually like a Latin reason for this, but we use I for other things. So capital J, that's your impulse. So this is a case where it's important to know what that notation is. Now we said previously for momentum that if you do the time derivative of force, force is just dp dt, and so that means this should also be a change in momentum. So we literally have two definitions for momentum impulse. It is the change in momentum and it is also the time derivative of force. So we could literally equate these two things together, right? This is, is true, that your time derivative of force is also equal to your change in momentum, but what we're normally going to do is talk about it in terms of impulse. We can find impulse this way or we can find impulse that way. So it, it is its own quantity. And when we think about this plot of force versus time, we said that force is going to have this complicated shape. So we're not normally going to be actually doing an integral here. We're going to be talking about impulse in general, or we, if we possibly do know the shape, we can do this integral, but that's normally going to be very hard to do. One of the things that we will do with impulse is talk about average force. So we've said that impulse is the area under the curve, but that this is going to be hard to do. But if you think about it, you can define different shapes of forces to have the same impulse. So instead of having this impulse, we can now define an average force that gives us the same impulse as before over the same duration. So you can see that your average force is going to be less in general than your maximum force and then we assume it's constant. Now this isn't to say that there really is a constant force but if we know what our impulse is we can find the average force and that might be an interesting question to ask in certain situations. So now we have a few things that we can think about at once but they're all really related. Let's go back to our ball colliding with the wall. Initially the momentum is to the right and note that in the book this is three parts and I've just tried to break it into columns and it's really helpful to see these two together. So this part and this part are literally the same thing. So initially it is moving to the right and it is not yet in contact with the wall because it's not in contact with the wall there's zero force. It's moving to the right and we would say that the right direction is the positive x hat direction and so initially early time you have a positive momentum right it's this is px and it's up from zero so it's positive. Then it comes into contact with the wall at this first dashed line here in time. And we see that the force starts and note that it's negative. Why is it negative? Because the force points to the left. So the force is pointing to the left and we see that our momentum begins to decrease. What happens at this next dashed line? Well at that point we have maximum compression and your momentum is zero. Why? At this moment it has stopped. It is in the process of turning around. Then the compression uh, starts relaxing. This is like the ball is a rubber ball and it's now pushing away from the wall after being compressed. And afterwards we have a velocity that's to the left. So we see that our momentum continues down. It's getting more and more negative and eventually contact ends and forces back to zero. Now note here in this situation that we're the after situation doesn't really mean that it's to the right of the wall. We're just trying to show that at this point the velocity is to the left. So note that this isn't a physical representation of what's going on, saying that it's to the left of the wall hitting the wall to the right of the wall, but what's important here are the velocity vectors. Right, in contact, and then the velocity vectors to the left. So we have a plot of momentum and we have a plot of force. We would say here that mom that impulse is the area under the curve. Kind of complicated to calculate, but we could visually represent it this way. 
we then have a change in momentum from what is happening right before it hits the wall to right after the wall and we define this as our delta p and that's equal to j now j being again our impulse now be careful because in this case we said that our force is negative so j our impulse is also negative so if we said what is p final minus p initial we'll note that final is negative initial was positive so this is less than zero what that's telling us is that initially it was traveling to the right we've now uh, changed by making it go to the left so be careful with your signs here again it does work out if you're very careful in the math but make sure that you explicitly use those signs final minus initial you have a negative value here you're then subtracting a positive value it is very much negative we now need to draw a distinction between work and impulse note that we've now had two different ways of plotting forces and doing an integral when we met the energy principle we could have talked about work relating to a force I always stress um, the potential energy when we can but if you can't talk about potential energy then you would want to define work and maybe you would define it this way um, if there's no potential energy to worry about if we're just looking at kinetic and not thermal and everything else so we would define work as the integral of force over position time does not appear and remember in general time does not appear when we're using energy however now for momentum we are again integrating force but now it's over time so please be careful about this that we can have force on our y-axis our vertical axis but it depends on what's on our horizontal axis if it's x position that gives you work if it's time you can get impulse and impulse is then our change in momentum so there is this parallel where if the only thing you're thinking about is kinetic energy if you don't have potential energy or thermal energy to worry about then you can do this integral and call it a change in kinetic energy or we are doing the integral in time calling it a change in momentum so please don't confuse these things and again um, a lot of this is given on the equation sheet you just have to know what the uh, notation actually means there is going to be an important simplification that we're making whenever we're talking about impulse and the book refers to this as the impulse approximation and a good example is thinking about a ball hitting the wall the interaction force the forces between the ball and the wall are very large and they're acting over a very short period of time so that's the first thing that if you if this is true then you can use the impulse approximation if this first point is not true it's not a good time to use the impulse approximation now the second thing here is that we would be only considering the momentum immediately before and immediately after the interaction so what that means is there might be other things going on but when we're talking about impulse we are only talking about right before and right after the interaction so if we're if this is true and we're doing this thing then we can neglect other forces during the interaction because they're smaller or at least they should be in terms of most collisions and an example for this is that if I took a rubber ball and I threw it at a horizontal wall you know that gravity is acting on that ball but we wouldn't actually worry about gravity in that those few little moments that very short period of time where the ball is interacting with the wall we would maybe need to think about gravity up and to when the ball is hitting the wall and we would maybe then think about gravity after the ball is done interacting with the wall but during that very short period of time where it's in contact with the wall the force between the wall and the ball is much larger than gravity so we would only worry about that we could calculate the change in momentum if we knew about the impulse but after that after it's no longer interacting with the wall you would think about gravity so that's the impulse approximation we can break out a chunk of the motion to just think about the interaction the final thing is that this simplification is not assuming a constant force during the interaction that's a bad simplification to make do not do that you could talk about the average force it's valid to use the interaction time and the impulse to talk about an average force but it's not actually a constant force so please don't make this assumption